Welcome to the show. It's time for Africa. Our guest this week is Robert Ngeru. He's the Vice President and Chief Operations Officer of Samsung East and Central Africa. We get your views on technology matters and we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishu. Our focus tonight is technology in Africa. What an exciting subject. Our guest is Robert Ngeru, who is the Vice President and the Chief Operations Officer of Samsung in East and Central Africa, covering 16 countries. Robert has an important role at Samsung in ensuring that its trade and marketing activities are viable and impactful in the region. Before joining the Samsung team, he was the mobile communications business manager at Microsoft from 2009 to 2010. Prior to this, he worked for four years as the regional manager at Motorola, having come from various positions at Allegis and Two-Way Communications Limited. He brings a wealth of knowledge to his current role, not only from previous experience in the mobile industry, but from his passion for Africa. He holds a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Sunderland, UK. Let's get straight to his views on technology and Africa. Robert, thank you so much for making time for the Africa Leadership Dialogues. My pleasure. Now, technology, there's no doubt, is transforming Africa in very many ways. And sure. People highlight different things, including use of mobile telephony, you know, payments through mobile phones. Um, but when you look at the technological space in Africa, what excites you the most? Well, um, I have a very huge technology background. So I'm passionate about technology and I'm more passionate about actually driving technology into Africa. Because when I look at the specs and the scope and where we are and uh, where the advanced world is, there's no reason as to why we shouldn't be in a better technological environment. Mm -hmm. So in, in a nutshell, when you look at Africa, Africa is on the forefront of leapfrogging on technology. And we will be the leaders in technology going forward. Everybody else has had the opportunity when you look at it. Asia, Americas, um, and uh, Europe's, they've had their lip, but we are still growing, so we have a huge bound to achieve. And there's a lot of things that we can do differently than we do today. Um, so th there's quite a bit of, uh, on a broad spectrum, from telephony to uh, mobile computing, uh, money transfers, to actually in-home televisions and uh, home appliances. You, you say something really important there, and I want to focus on that for a moment. You say, we will be the leaders. That you know, everyone else has had their chance, they've yes. had their time, the biggest growth now is in Africa. Sure. How do we gain from that growth? Because now I think there's a lot of attention coming from all kinds of players. Sure. How do we make sure that the growth that does happen is also relevant and important to African communities? First and foremost, we have to uh, make a good 10, 15 year plan because some of these things will come and hit you by, like a storm. So you'll, you'll be hit with faster speeds of internet mm -hmm. or faster telephony or electricity and you're not prepared for it. So on a timeline, I would urge the leaders to actually create a 10 to 15 year business plan on where do they want to be and where do they want to go. Then secondly, we have the largest youth age group in the world so and they're vibrant especially kenya they're extremely vibrant they want to learn more they want to experience they want to explore so even when you look at uh, apps development i think kenya is the largest app development center in in, in sub-saharan africa mm -hmm. and we have all sorts of collaborations with different um, organizations be it universities secondary schools or uh, tertiary schools, such that we give them the skills of learning on electronics and driving electronics technology across. So once we bridge that gap and cover the youth, that middle gap with the knowledge and information that they have, can you imagine what they're going to be in another 10 years from now? 
that paints a picture for us. Let's come to the role of corporates, businesses, and you head Samsung. What are you doing as a company to transform Africa? Oh, lots of things. Um, first and foremost, we have a lot of uh, local employment. Uh, in, in, in all my countries, I serve East and Central Africa, mm -hmm. which are 16 countries. And in each of those 16 countries, I am actually an African leader who actually champions the growth and development of our marketing and growth initiatives in that country. Because nobody can come here and do it better than I can. And either way, you can't do it better in Uganda, Tanzania, DRC, Gabon, or Ethiopia than they can by themselves. So you're saying you go in and you hire local talent. Absolutely. That's what you do. Yes. Right. So we get local talent because they understand and know the market better. Then from there on, in terms of participation, we look at the gaps, the opportunities that um, in terms of a country or a community, where are they missing and how can we bridge between what they don't have and what we have. So one is transfer technology to the people we employ. Secondly is empowering the regions of which we work in. Uh, for example, right here in Nairobi, we've donated a solar-powered internet school to Arab Moy Secondary School um, in Rongai. And that's no cost to them. And we monitor it and make sure that they're using it. Actually, uh, when the schools closed last semester, we took the teachers for a refresher training mm -hmm. so that whenever we get new skills, we transfer to them and they can be able to transfer to the students. And not only them, even um, a, a teacher training, teacher program. So they empower the other teachers who don't understand. Um, technology is advancing and uh, blackboards are slowly diminishing, so electronics is becoming the main thing. Um, students going to school, they're more knowledgeable than the teacher. So we equip the teachers with information such that learning be still becomes exciting. That there's so much staying with education sure. and, and knowing that you are interested as a company in education. Yes. There's so much skepticism around application of technology in schools. Yes. And, and some teachers say, you know, there's so many other challenges that we're facing. Mm -hmm. But you've said, look, it makes a difference. What argument would you give them in terms of trying to convince particularly teachers, government, uh, you know, public servants that this is the way to go? Actually, the biggest resistance is teachers because they don't want to change. They're so used to the same way of teaching and chalk and pen and their notes and they don't want to change that. So we've sat down with the communities and trained them on how to transform their notes into digital and store content on servers so that they can be able to access. And that makes it easier and that's when we embr they embrace that. Mm. So we've, that's why I'm saying, including last time, we trained the teachers again at uh, the Arab Moy So refresher training yeah, courses. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the same things they used to, um, it might be little notes, take pictures of them and store them on your Google Drive or <laughs> SkyDrive. And you can refer to them anywhere you are. So you don't need to carry a notebook. Um, you just need a tablet or some form of smart phone or computer mm -hmm. and you can be able to access it, then it's accessible anywhere. And then with time, you turn those notes into PowerPoint presentations, which make it more exciting for the students. And you get practical examples from the students and you learn a lot. So it becomes a sharing experience between mm -hmm. the teacher and the student. So it's not just one-way communication. It's, you have two-way communications between the teacher and the student. So that way, the, the, the teachers are excited. And once they get excited, they're also excited to teach. Yes. And, clans, the and then learning, students enjoy it. Yeah, learning becomes fun. <laughs> yes, uh, many people are wondering, I wish, you know, back in the day I had fun in <laughs> class. Maybe it could have been fun. Um, sure. So let's go to now the, the whole idea that the African middle class, in, in many countries, not in all countries, but that the, there's a growing African middle class. Absolutely. There's an increase in the ability to spend money. Yeah. Um, is that reflected? In, when you look at your sales patterns, are you seeing a change? Are, are, are we growing our middle class, particularly across the whole region that you manage? Very, very, very true. And that's actually the biggest growth sector because everybody's becoming quite aspirational. And the whole idea is around content availability. Um, not only is it information, but uh, TV channels are more available everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, internet is more accessible. So people want to improve their lifestyles. They want to live better, they want to live healthier. Uh, previously, people might not have had refrigerators. I had an example in Ethiopia, actually, Refrigerators are one of their biggest priorities because of food storage. Right. 
And how they learn about this is because of just becoming more knowledgeable. They become knowledgeable and it's actually cheaper. Instead of buying small rations of food, mm -hmm. you buy a refrigerator and you can be able to store two weeks food. They don't need to go to the supermarket or the little kiosk every other day. So that middle class is growing. And the next thing is uh, TVs because of need for content, mm -hmm. news and information and entertainment. It's, it's, it's sprouting all across the world. You know, previously um, in the 70s, you would learn of an incident that happened in Europe like three, four days later. Mm -hmm. uh, today, it's, it's 30 seconds later. It's 30 seconds, even across Africa. Anywhere in the world, wow. whatever happens, you can learn about it in 30 seconds. So that's amazing. It's the power of internet. It's the power of TV and news. Um, you were no longer in the dark ages. Mm -hmm. So we also have to empower our societies to be ready and embrace that. How do we control the negative aspects? And, and we know what they are. You know, it's access to whether it's pornography for young people, you oh. know, um, criminal activities that are ongoing on some of these platforms. What are your thoughts on, on what we need to do? As I said, there's a reality check and many people maybe might not be able to do this. But um, we have to have reality checks amongst ourselves and as families and communities and console and guide each other so that you, when I was growing up, if I made a mistake, I would be spanked by the neighbor and I would get home and the same thing would happen. Mm. Today, it's, it, you can't do that. So it's about communal living and understanding each other. And when there's something wrong, try and explain and adapt to it. And again, all these things, and I keep telling, including my children, mm. even in the movies, they're acting. So you have to live a real life mm -hmm. and today's life, you know, follow the rules, be disciplined and yes, ma'am, and please and thank you. Don't lose yourself yes. in this technological Don't world. Don't get lost in the technology world. Just you are a human being yes. and you have a long time to go. This technology will come and go and it will actually advance. So you better embrace yourself in line with the society around you. Do good things to society. Do good things to the society, don't lose yourself and especially when it comes to all the social media platforms and especially young people who often don't know what they're doing or how it could impact them later, don't lose you, don't do anything that you wouldn't do out in the, in the open in front, of your, in front of your parents and neighbours and communities and uh, Actually, Whatever you friends. do, watch out and be sure that you can look back at it three, four years down the road mm -hmm. and you're still proud of it. Right. Powerful, powerful there. Yeah. Um, let's go to your hopes and aspirations. Sure. Just looking at Africa, you've, you've studied abroad. Yeah. You, you now head 16 countries sure. um, in, in terms of Samsung. Yes. And there are disappointments we may have with our continents, but there are also hopes and aspirations. So let's actually start with your disappointments <laughs> and then move to your hopes and aspirations. What are they? Disappointments, uh, a couple of them. Governance is one. Um, um, governance in many of the countries that I, I participate in business is not very, very straightforward uh, in terms of policy makings and policy adoptions and the way you do business and the regulations are quite different in different uh, atmospheres and environments. Mm -hmm. So that's a big disappointment of which if all the leaders and the political and government leaders would actually create flows to make business easier in these countries, we would be 10 years ahead. We hear that constantly, streamline, sure. open up the borders, Absolutely. don't make it so difficult. So these are some of the things. That's, that's, that's a big disappointment. And knowing that they all know the rest of the world and they watch. So it's, it's, it's embarrassing that we don't do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, um, the next part is, is around uh, workforce as well. Uh, workforce is a challenge, uh, but to get In, the on, best. On a continent, Robert, with a huge youth bulge, with such high unemployment, you are actually saying that workforce is a challenge. It is not. Is it training? Is it, is it a question of training? So that's what I'm getting to. Yes. It's a challenge in terms of everybody wants from zero to 100 in a day. Oh. Okay. People are not that patient enough. So training is what is crucial. 
And that was you, what we have actually started at Samsung. We started our Samsung Engineering Academy, where we train young students right from high school and college. And we show them how to break down all our electronic equipments and assemble them back. And we don't charge them a penny. For free? For free. What do they have? I, a lot of people have just heard you say that. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to tweet Julie now and find out how do I get it. How, how does someone who is interested in getting that training access it? If you're in a technical school or a technical university and you have technical interests, uh, we conduct uh, searches with um, a team of university graduates mm -hmm. where we go around and select the potential students and we do our vetting program for them. And every year we train about 200 students in Kenya. And the hope is to actually train 10,000 students across Africa in the next uh, eight years or so. So be the best you can. Yes. If, if you're in college or school studying yes. a technical subject, do the best you can. Absolutely. So you'll be picked yes. from the crop. Yes. And, and that's how life is. Yeah. Life, and, life uh, seeks the... Not only in Kenya. We have one in Kenya. We have one in Ethiopia. We are starting another one in DRC as well as Gabon. So you're spreading as much as possible. DRC is, is a very interesting case study. There seems to be huge demand for certain things in the market in DRC and still quite a few challenges. What is it like, um, you know, teetering um, or operating in an environment that has both challenges but such huge opportunity as well? Yeah, um, it's challenging as well, um, but there's still, as I say, there's still a few, or not few, there are many, but just to streamline them and train them and get them to the right trends, um, it's, it's a challenge. But we do still manage. Mm -hmm. we, we actually manage to get uh, teams from this um, youth and entrepreneurial, uh, technical, interested um, students, and we groom them, train them, and after that, actually, majority of them end up working with our partners or our office as right, well. Right. And the ones who are more enterprising, um, there's one who wrote to me about two weeks ago that he wants to start up a, a service center of their own. So that's how enterprising it can be. And, and you would look at supporting something like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. As long as you're enterprising and you mean well, yes. we will support. Let's talk about, we've literally nearly come to the close of the <laughs> show, so um, what's your vision? What's your personal vision for Africa? And I think you, we hadn't really touched on your hopes and aspirations. So maybe, <laughs> maybe we can kind of inter, interlope or inter, yeah, the two. Hopes and aspirations, um, as you said, I started outside and I came back here. And one of the biggest challenges when I came back is looking at the technical gaps that we have uh, between the Western world and our emerging Africa. Um, I sat back and looked at, uh, that was back in 2005. I think we only had uh, about five or six million subscribers out of a, a population of 35 million mm -hmm. or so. So I saw a gap in 30 million people who need connectivity. In every home that you're moving into the Western world, it has a TV and it has a fridge and a washing machine. We don't have that here. So that's why I moved back to Africa to drive technology mm -hmm. and make sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible. So that's my dream, that's my trend, that's my vision. That's my hope that Africa will always be the leader in technology advancement and we will not be left behind. Right. Like, they, they will no longer call us an emerging market. I would like us to call it, I'd like to change this to a developed con continent. Right. And it makes sense. I don't see any reason as to why not. We have equal opportunities and chances, just like any other. We have the infrastructure, uh, we have the equipment, we have the talent, and we have the skills. So it's all about training. And that's why I opted to actually drive technology transformation in Africa. I want you to look into the camera. And with those thoughts, uh, you know, you have painted a picture for us of what could be possible, Africa leading. Um, what do we need to do as individuals? What must the leadership do to take us where we need to be? Well, when you compare the leadership in Africa, <clears throat> as I said, it's, it's missing a couple of gaps. But those gaps are achievable. And there's no reason as to why we should not be the leader of 
the emerging markets and stop being called emerging and we developed. So development is all in ourselves. Development is a personal conscious thing that we can do to grow the societies and the communities we operate in. So I urge every other person to participate in developing their communities and societies because this will bring good challenges and good reputations to themselves and the country as a whole. Do your part. Do yeah. your part. It means good for you, but it yeah. also means good for the wider society. Yeah, good for you, good for the society. Thank you so much. Robert. Thank you. Great to have you. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. My name is Robert Ngeru. I'm the Vice President of Samsung Electronics East Africa, and you're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogue. Fascinating insights there, but what are your thoughts on the issues? Time for your views now. This week, we asked you, how can African countries encourage technological absorption and innovation? Gituku James Kinyanjui says, African governments must invest heavily in research and innovation to enhance and identify technological needs in different states. Private sector must partner with government to initiate digital incubation centers, find new innovation, equip interested persons, give support and guidance and help enact policies that encourage innovation. Bob at Cool Bob says, Opening up technology and ideological boundaries and allowing seamless flow of skills across countries to utilize existing technology. My name is William Andre, watching Africa Leadership Dialogues from Nairobi. African countries can encourage technological absorption and innovation by first understanding their technological needs so that they can adopt relevant and applicable training for technological literacy and innovation. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. And now it's Africa's top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature countries with growing foreign direct investment in technology transfer. This research focused on the extent in which foreign direct investment, FDI, promotes the incorporation of new technology in Africa. It is ranked out of a possible seven. This is according to the World Economic Forum. Starting us off at number 10 is Senegal, with an index of 4.6 and ranked number 74 globally. Coming in at number 9 is Zambia. The nation is ranked at number 64 globally with an index of 4.72. Positioned at number 8 is Cap Verde. The island nation is ranked at position 61 globally with an index of 4.74. Taking the number 7 spot is Kenya with an index of 4.75 and is ranked at number 59 globally. At number 6 is Namibia. The South African country attained an index of 4.77 and is ranked 58th globally. Slotted in at number 5 is Mauritius. The island nation recorded an index of 4.78 and is ranked at number 57 globally. Uganda comes in at number 4. The East African nation is ranked at number 56 globally with an index of 4.79. Positioned at number 3 is South Africa with an index of 4.8 and is ranked 50th globally. Coming in at number 2 is Morocco with an index of 4.82 and is ranked at number 45 globally. And at number 1 this week is Rwanda. Being one of the fastest growing nations in Africa, Rwanda is ranked at number 25 globally with an index of 5.1. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. As always, we end this show with words of wisdom, another African proverb for you. Where there are experts, there will be no lack of learners. Think about it. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.